My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and of course, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that is, I think, really come to the forefront of how we think about the modern workplace these days over the last couple of years, which is... What is a good job and how do we create good jobs? And this really came up during the pandemic when you had all these frontline workers who were making not a lot of money in these companies where CEOs were making a ton of money and people just sort of got fed up. And that led to the whole quiet quitting thing, which I think might be dead now because the economy has sort of turned or maybe it hasn't, we don't really know. But regardless, Everybody's been talking about the fact that workplaces are not, they're not succeeding. They're not creating jobs that are giving people dignity and a fair wage. And it's a real problem. And there, there's a reason why more than 70% of people, according to Gallup, are completely disconnected at their day jobs. So this is an important topic for all of us. And I have a very special person to talk about it. Her name is Zainab Tan. And she's a professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management in the area of operations management. She's also the president of the nonprofit Good Jobs Institute, where she works with companies to improve their operations in a way that satisfies employees, customers, and investors alike. Before she joined MIT Sloan, she spent seven years on the faculty of Harvard Business School. And she's the author of The Good Job Strategy, How the Smartest Companies Invest in Employees to Lower Costs and Boost Profits. And her new book, which we'll be talking about today, The Case for Good Jobs, How Great Companies Bring Dignity, Pay, and Meaning to Everybody's Work. Now, the cool thing about Zainab is that she was actually my professor. In fact, her first year at Harvard Business School, she taught me operations and teaching me operations, that's no easy job. I, we did these cases that I, I don't even really know how I made it through that semester. I'm just not good at that, but she was a good teacher and she helped me out and I learned a ton. And she just is a very incisive thinker. You will see today how she looks at the world. It's very interesting because a lot of our guests are big picture entrepreneurs. Zainab thinks about operations. She's really in the weeds there in a good way, thinking about how companies should be setting up their systems. And so it's a lot of insight into how this can be done to make better jobs and then ultimately to make companies more successful. So you're going to learn about that. You're going to learn about, number one, what is a good job in this day and age? Because we clearly have an issue. We're also going to talk about that conventional wisdom that wages and profits are somehow inversely correlated uh, why that is wrong. And in fact, by paying people more, you can actually make more money. And Zainab's going to give us some advice on how we can create good jobs. So this is a really important listen for you, for a policymaker, for an entrepreneur, for anybody who's just thinking about how to make a better workplace out there. Now, my small ask today is easy. Go to FOMOSapiens.com and I got a little job for you and it's a good job, I promise. Take a look at the site and let me know if there's something I should add that you would find valuable. You can reach out to me at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com on Twitter at PJ McGinnis and on Instagram at Patrick J McGinnis. All right, everybody. It's time for Zainab. It's time for the professor. We're about to get schooled. Now, as you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. So I started out by asking Zainab this, what's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? I think for the last 10 years or so, the most important would be to start the nonprofit Good Jobs Institute. When my first book came out in 2014, I started getting requests from lots of company leaders asking for help. And at that time, I had four kids and a job. And my general answer was, no, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. I become very good at saying no, by the way. Uh, but then one of my mentors convinced me that to be able to make a difference, I had to help these companies. I had to help these leaders and I had to learn how to adapt a good job system. So since then, we work with dozens of companies and learned a ton along the way. You know, first of all, I just want to say I'm jealous that you're good at saying no, because 
It's my life work figuring out how to do that. But uh, uh, but, but yeah, can I tell you why I say no and where I learned that from? Yes, please. Because when I studied the companies that were able to create great outcomes for their customers, employees, and investors at the same time, one of the things that I realized that was common among them was to be able to say no. They weren't trying to be all things to all their customers. They had clarity on who they were serving and exactly what they would offer them. So I asked myself, like, what is it that I want to achieve? And what are the things that are in line with that? And I've become very good at saying no, just emulating those um, great companies. All right. You've already brought a big idea to the show today. I want to talk a little bit about your new book. It's called The Case for Good Jobs. And you just talked about this nonprofit you started. The, the Good Jobs Institute. So what's the big idea here? What what are you what's the problem you're trying to solve with your work? Yeah. So the big idea that came from my first book is that offering good jobs is a choice. Mm. It's a choice that, that's available to even low cost retailers. And the big idea of this book is why you should make that choice and how to make it. So there are two big lessons. One is that paying employees low wages, not investing in them and operating with high turnover is a lot more expensive than company leaders may think. So that's the first, that status quo is actually worse than you may think. And changing your system to adapt it to a good job system is less riskier than you may think. Oftentimes we think about system change as being too difficult, too risky. So I wanna show them that you can change and you don't have to be a superhero to be able to do that. Oh, this is good. I, we're gonna get into both of those today, but but I do wanna talk about the moment we're in because we just before we, we were in the green room, we were chatting and I was talking about the fact that I went to this flower shop in New York City at the Tin Building, which is Jean Georges. Very, I mean, it's very, everybody, it's high end. Of course it is. But it was like a tulip was like $15. And a lot of people don't make $15 an hour. So when you see that disconnect, when you see the difference between CEO pay and frontline pay, especially after everybody talked about how important frontline workers were. Remember, we were all focused on that during the pandemic. When you see the disquality, the inequality, is mind blowing, but you know, I, I, Zainab, I know that this is, you know, this is the the context. But talk about what's going on out there. Yeah, it is mind blowing. And Patrick, we oftentimes focus on the CEO pay because it's just so huge, mm. right? And it's so easy to talk about. But let's look at what's happening to a typical worker in the United States. For forty years, real wages of Americans have not increased. For forty years. Uh, $15 an hour seems like a lot of money, but even if you work 40 hours a week, 50 hours, uh, 50, 50 weeks a year, that comes to like $31,000. Mm -hmm. It's unlivable in most places in the United States. So we have millions of people who have been left behind with low wages and low pay ends up hurting people. And of course, when you have low wages, you end up spending, you know, having two or three jobs you're constantly under stress. You can't sleep at night. You're constantly thinking about, am I going to be able to pay my rent this week? Or can I do this? And, and you lack hope. And that's not a good place to be for a country to have tens of millions of workers uh, feeling this way and not having a strong middle class. Now, is this a U.S. thing? Is this a global thing? Like, How do you think about the sort of the geopolitical aspects of all of this? You know, um, my research has been mostly in the United States. There are some companies that I studied outside the United States. Um, but the U.S., of course, has a very low minimum wage, mm. right? The U.S. has lots of characteristics that make it too easy for companies uh, to operate this way. So let's talk about that first kind of trend that you mentioned, which is the conventional wisdom, because it is you know, having worked in private equity and, you know, you're, a, you've been a professor at MIT and Harvard business school. So a lot of your, your students go off into these jobs where, you know, the idea of raising wages, it's like, well, we can't afford that because we're going to not make as much money. And therefore we got to, you got to cut costs. And, and I guess what, you know, that is the conventional wisdom. Talk about why that's wrong and then give us an example of how this actually plays out in the real world. Yeah, first of all, that conventional wisdom, right? We have generations of business leaders who have been taught that people are just a cost to be minimized. Lean and mean is what drives efficiency. Pay market wages, make your decisions with data, right? That's what we've, we, we've taught. 
but people are not soybeans, right? They're not like any other input to production mm -hmm. and paying people low wages and operating with high turnover costs a lot of companies a lot more than they might realize. For example, there are just direct cost of turnover, which can be huge, Patrick. I work with a bunch of companies now and it could be 10 to 25% of payroll dollars spent on turnover, but then there are lost sales, there are mistakes, there is low productivity. So low wages already are expensive for companies. Just redirect what you already pay for into people's wages. So so this is this is one of the reasons to, to adapt this now. And coming back to the moments that we're in right now, wages are going to raise in the United States, right? Minimum wages are already increasing. Uh, we see so many different cities and states having $15, even higher minimum wages and they will continue to increase. The baby boomers are retiring. People are not having as many kids, which means we're not gonna have that many people uh, for all the jobs that we have. And companies that don't adopt, adopt a good job system, they're gonna end up paying their workers more anyway, right? But if they don't change their system, if they still treat humans like a pair of hands, their turnover will stay high, their productivity will be low because the job is the same job. But if they do change and adopt a good job system, then that higher pay is going to be an investment for them with a pretty good return. FOMO. FOMO. Now, you, you're, you're talking about pay, but you also mentioned there how people are treated. And I'm curious, as you think about what companies are going wrong, part of it is you know, definitely there's a money thing, right? But people don't just quit or, or leave jobs because of money. They quit because of a different sort of set of reasons so as well. So what are some of those elements that are contributing to this problem? Yeah, and I'll, maybe it might be helpful to step back and say what the good job system is. Oh, yeah, because let's it's not do just that. About pay, right? it's, it's not because oftentimes people see the title of my first book, Good Job Strategy, and they think it's just about HR. But as you remember, Patrick, in my class, um, <laughs> I'm an operations person. And, and what the good job strategy is, it's about winning. Right? It's about winning in business. What does it take to win? To be able to win, you have to have a great team. Like, have you ever seen a team, you know, that's poor, but that wins? So you have no. to have a great team. So you have to invest in your people. You have to pay them enough so that they can focus on the job, not about whether they're going to be able to pay their rent and, and keep them. And winning also requires positioning your team for success. So positioning them for success, this is in line with what is a good job, right? You want their work to be meaningful. You want their work to be um, done with respect. You have to respect their time. So don't waste their time asking them to do tedious things. Trust them to make decisions. Empower them to make decisions. Give them enough time so they're not burnt out. So these are all the elements that go into a good job. But they also are elements that increase the productivity of the workers and enable the companies to win with their customers and 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 uh, create great performance. So let's talk about what that looks like. Like, give us an example. Tell us a story about a, a, a company that that is doing this well and is kind of transitioned into this from from you know kind of figuring out how to implement a good, good job system and then what's happened since. Yeah. So one company that changed recently is Sam's Club. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, Walmart's uh, wholesale club. And before 2017, Sam's Club was really running behind their largest competitor, Costco. Their performance was mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. And a new CEO comes in and this new CEO says, I am not happy with the status quo. I want to run a great company. And a great company is about creating great value for customers. So what value am I going to create for the customers? And they clarified their value proposition and they realized that we can't win with their custom with our customers if we don't keep turnover low, if we can't execute well operationally. Mm -hmm. So and if we don't set our people up for success. So for them, I mentioned two things, right? Investment in people and setting people up for success. Investment in people was like they invested five to seven dollars an hour for lots of positions from a basis of fifteen dollars an hour in pay so imagine you're working in the bakery you were making working um 40 hours a week and you were making fifteen dollars an hour now you're making 22 dollars an hour 
your life changes. Wow. Right. And 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 they also implemented stable schedules that enable their employees to have a life, right? Predictable, consistent schedules. That's the investment in people. But they made other changes to set their employees for success and leverage that investment. For example, they reduced their product variety by about 25%. They realize that they don't have to offer their customers everything. Being a retailer is about choosing the right products and their members were coming to them for low prices. So reducing that product variety enabled their employees to be more productive and it enabled them to serve the customers well, enabled them to keep the products in stock so customers were happy because they could actually find the stuff. Like one of the customers thanked um, one of the Sam's Club's leaders for carrying this electric toothbrush. And the leader said, we've always had this electric toothbrush, but the stores were so cluttered that no one could find them, right? So, so they reduced variety, they made their customers happier, employees happier, and, and their performance so much higher. And then they made a bunch of other changes as well. How do they figure out what to do? Like, what is the process that one goes through? Because it, some of the stuffs, I mean, I, I, I know I, I learned all this in your class, I'm certain, but I forgot some of these things. And so it's it's not obvious stuff, actually, some of it, like, you know, the, the assortment, the number of SKUs in the store. When you tell me this, I'm like, oh, it makes sense, right? Just too much complexity. But, you know, I wouldn't have been like an obvious that that would have a, sort of an effect on creating better jobs for people who work there. So like, how, what was their kind of process to figure this out? So... One of the, I will say, you say it's not obvious, but I, I will quote Walmart's USA's previous CEO, Greg mm -hmm. Foran, after reading my first book, and I talk about four different operational choices that enable high productivity and contribution. He said, this is blindingly obvious. Mm. And it's blindingly obvious because if you're competing on the basis of cost, your customers are coming to you because you have to provide them the lowest cost and great products, of course, lower product variety would help you, right? You, I mean, it, it, so, so um, what it does take is courage because you look at everybody else and you say, hey, that company is offering that, that company is offering that. So I'm going to offer that too because that's going to increase my sales. What I have seen as I work with companies was they look at so many of their competitors and see what they're doing. And then they say, okay, we'll just do the same. But that's not a strategy. You know, we call that FOMO. FOMO. <laughs> yeah, that was a long answer, but it, but it is. And, and we, you know, one of the things we do, Patrick, is we run workshops with companies. Mm -hmm. So we will run a two-day workshop and we go through the whole good job system. And we include people from all different functions in the organization, including unit managers. And they realize what changes they need to make. Again, these are obvious changes, but it requires courage sometimes to do to make the obvious changes. So it's a combination of getting all the right people, sitting down and looking at at everything, having a system, which is a good job system. And then it's you're right, the third part, which is courage, which by the way, being courageous isn't always rewarded. So that's another part is creating incentives for companies to be courageous or for managers to be courageous. But if you take those three things together, that feels like it's the ingredients you need to make change. You're exactly right. When we bring leaders together, they understand how their decisions affect the front lines to be able to serve the customer well and what they need to change. But sometimes they look at their own silo. Like if I'm in logistics and I am being rewarded on minimizing transportation costs, now I'm thinking of minimizing transportation costs. I don't care maybe how consistent those deliveries are or how predictable they are because that's what I focus on. But when we bring these leaders together, they realize, hey, our actions have these types of consequences and how do we change our system, including aligning those functions and changing that the way that they're rewarded so that we can make decisions that are customer centric and frontline centric. So we have a lot of people who listen to the show who are entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, and I'm sure they're thinking of themselves because I know you guys, you're saying, this sounds good, this sounds good, but you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're it's just all scarce resources all the time. And I understand the argument, you know, that you're making, which is like, listen, it's more expensive over the long run. But for somebody who's starting out in a, in a, in a new business, like take us through some of the principles that they can draw from in order to just do this from the outset. When you are an entrepreneur, 
you have the opportunity to start something great from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of one entrepreneur, uh, Jim Sinegal, 40 years ago when he started Costco in the Northwest, in Seattle, um, in their very first store. And you could say, you know, this is a guy who is starting the first store. They were paying almost double the industry average, right? Because they had this conviction that for us to be able to win with our customers, we must have a great team and we must set them up for success, right? It's a very simple formula. Once you have that conviction, do everything possible to create that system. And it's so much easier to build it from scratch than to change along the way. Like those of your listeners who might have gone through a home renovation mm. would know that. Right? It's so difficult to change the home when it's been around for 100 years. It's so much easier to do it from the beginning. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> As somebody who just had his bathroom wall replaced, I, I know what that's about. <laughs> And, you know, so many entrepreneurs, I mean, let's start with many of them fail, right? That, that's the, the, but wouldn't it be better to fail, try to do something great and with your values? FOMO. FOMO. Zainab, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, all of this is making me think. First of all, it inspires me that business school professors are leading the charge on, like, trying to think about how capitalism can be better. Because, we, you know, it can't stay the same. Like anything else, it has to get better if it's going to succeed and thrive and be not be rejected by people. So that makes a lot of sense to me. I also think about, you know, the move towards mission-driven companies and the fact that, like, if you do things like this, you can tell people what you're doing and therefore your customers will actually go to your business because they're saying, well, you know, this is really good. Like this business is acting in a way that, really matches with my values, right? And so the customer can be part of the conversation around what good jobs looks like. Is that something that you've looked, like how have you kind of seen that play out in, in the work that you've been doing? It could be a part of the conversation, but customers already see who mm. is offering good jobs because of the service that they receive, mm. right? There's a huge difference. If you're in Texas, those of your listeners, there's a huge difference between going to an HEB which is the, the, the largest supermarket chain there that creates good jobs, and to another supermarket, right? There's a huge difference going to Trader Joe's and a typical supermarket. So, so as a customer, you can tell by the way that you're being treated. And th the question about, you know, would customers go to companies that create good jobs for other reasons? I'm not so sure. I think customers end up doing what is best for the customers. So I don't know if that's... Um, that's something that I would focus too much on. All right. All right. I tried. I tried to get creative, but she yeah. reeled me back in. Now, I, I, one thing that we've been talking a lot, a, a lot on this show is, and I think it's something that, you know, it's been in the conversation, whether it's AI, whether it's automation, the workforce is changing. And it's interesting. I was listening over the weekend to um, a podcast about driverless cars and what that means. And the person who was talking was saying, well, yes, there'll be less drivers, but those people can do something else. They can just, you know, maybe it'll be a driverless restaurant and they can cook the food and deliver the food. And it was sort of like, I felt like it was quite heart heartless really to just expect, you know, that people can be retrained very easily. And that all of a sudden, you know, it's like the people are so interchangeable, but obviously in, a, in an environment where technology is disrupting the workforce, it does create pressures on employers, and on companies to think about like how do we given all these external pressures how do we respond in a way that still allows us to create good jobs so how how have you thought about that challenge yeah patrick technology doesn't happen to us mm. we shape how we implement different technologies right we can look at a technology and say i'm just going to use it to substitute people and people mm. are interchangeable parts anyway or what companies like Sam's Club, the one that we talked about before did was to say, hey, how can we use technology to create a much better customer experience and to increase the productivity of our workforce so that we can pay them more and we can create you know, a much better job. So technology could also be used to enhance or, or to augment humans and empower them. I'll give you one example. If you went to a Sam's Club, you know, 
six years ago and you want to change your car's tire, mm. um, it would take like half an hour for the associate there to try to figure out what the tire, what tire works for you because they would look at the different manuals, etc. But they've automated that process. Now for that associate, it takes like three minutes. What does that mean? Not that associate can really talk to the customer, look at them in the eye and say, what are you going to use these tires for? How can I be an advocate for you, help you make the right choice? And by the way, because they're adding more value now, now you can pay them more. So technology can be a great enabler of empowerment, good jobs, if we use the technology right. And it's up to us to, to use it right. Yeah, it's you make me think. I mean, this is really important insight because I was just thinking, okay, so you know, when you told me, when you mentioned the Sam's, the Sam's tire thing, I thought, okay, great. You can just increase throughput, right? You can just run more cars through in a day. But what I wasn't thinking and shame on me was you can, you can, you could potentially do that, but you can also allocate the employee to providing a better service to the end customer, to learning what they really need and therefore giving the customer a better experience. It isn't just about cutting costs. It's also about giving better services. Exactly. And when I looked at the companies that adopted this good job system versus others, I saw the biggest difference perhaps was in their mindsets, mm. right? These companies were obsessed with creating value for the customer. Like that's what they draw toward all the time. Whereas the other ones, they made all their decisions looking at numbers. What increases my sales, right? That's why they add more products. That's, that's why they add more promotions, etc. But but the financial versus customer mindset, centric mindset was a huge difference between the companies that have a good job system and that don't. Yeah. And if you're an investor or you're an entrepreneur, don't just sit looking at the spreadsheet. Go into where the customers are and talk to them and observe. I, I, I just I, I am amazed at how many times in my private equity days we invest in a company, but we never talk to one of their like we talk to their fancy clients, their big client. We didn't talk to like the the dude who went into the shop. And if you're not doing that, you have no idea what they're thinking. There is so much disconnect between what happens or what people at the home office thinks versus what actually is happening in the front lines. And if more front line, more managers and leaders spent time in the front lines, talking to employees, talking to customers, they would learn so much about their business. All right. So I have one last question for you, which is we're going to get into the future mindset because, you know, okay. the world is always, as you, you just made a good point, like there's always technology. It doesn't happen to us. We use it. So there'll be new technologies that I don't even know what they are yet, but I want to go forward 20 years and I want you to predict for me, you know, assuming some people follow <laughs> and they will follow your system. Like what does our, our workforce look like what, what, as compared to today? Ooh, you know, I don't like making predictions, Patrick. Oh, come on. I, come on now. <laughs> okay, 20 years from now, I will tell you what I'm working towards. Okay. Right? I am working towards more companies treating their employees like human beings who have not just a pair of hands, but also have a brain and a heart. And I'm hoping that's what we'll see 20 years from now. I'll, I, I'm, I'm expecting a lot more automation, a lot more robots. And a lot fewer people. So, so we need in that system to be able to use the complete human being versus what Henry Ford said. Why is it that I need to have a whole person when all I need is a pair of hands? Mm. So that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm working towards. And I think that's what might happen. All right. The book is called The Case for Good Jobs. It is out now. If you want to find out more about Zainab and follow her, you can find her on Twitter at Zainab Tan. And you can find her on LinkedIn, where she is very active. So go check that out. Uh, Professor Zainab Tan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Patrick. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.